have your Bible, please turn to the 8th chapter of Romans. Romans chapter 8. Paul's opponents, you remember among the Christians in Rome, have been challenging the gospel that he preaches. They question whether Paul's gospel could be God's gospel because it doesn't appear to have any visible or tangible power over sin, over the world. It doesn't really change everything, at least not what can be seen. After all, in 817, Paul had just written that if we are children of God, we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. Being promised, being guaranteed suffering is not what we think of getting when we receive the gospel by believing in it. It sounds antithetical to being justified and reconciled to God. Shouldn't that alleviate suffering, at least to some degree? Paul's gospel does have power. It is the very power of God, but it's not some kind of special spiritual power to overcome and avoid all the suffering and difficulties of life. That has never been promised to us. We shouldn't expect it. We do damage to our faith when we do. It's not a power that ends our struggles with sin. It's not a power that makes every road we walk on in life extra smooth because we have decided to follow Jesus. There were Christians in Rome like those in Corinth that Paul dealt with, like many today, many today, who claim that true Christians, the ones who really get it, they should be immune from the afflictions and sufferings of this world. If you had more faith, If you were more diligent about this or about that, maybe your life wouldn't be so filled with trials and troubles. But that's not the gospel promise. It's not God's word to us. Paul preaches that the new creation has begun, but for now, for now it exists alongside and concurrent with the old creation. Paul has no delusions of grandeur that he preaches with. He doesn't want us to get burdened down by unrealistic expectations for this life either. Paul stays anchored in the reality of our actual experiences in this current age where we live, one in which all people and all creation, including Christians, suffer under the conditions imposed upon it and upon all who live in it. We have been saved, beloved, in the hope of finally being saved. Not just from sin and death, but from the corruption and futility of this world. Let me pray. God and Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord. My strength, my rock, and my redeemer. And watch over all who hear that we may believe your perfect and gracious word in the name of Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen. Picking up Romans 8 in verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That's the conclusion Paul has reached as he ponders the subject of suffering for Christians and all the difficulties we face. What is to be gained by us in the future, beloved, will literally be so glorious that it will make what our suffering took from us seem very small by comparison. But that feeling, that realization is in the future. This suffering, however, that he's talking about now is somewhat separate or set apart from the suffering he was speaking of in verse 17. That suffering is the suffering we experience as Christians in our ongoing struggle against sin and unbelief. The sufferings of this present time, in verse 18, however, is not the suffering we experience specifically because we're Christians, but because we're humans. These sufferings are what we experience because we live in a fallen world where everything has been subjected to corruption and decay. The sufferings of this present time are the result of nothing being the way it's supposed to be. All of us and all creation will continue under that curse as long as this world continues in its present form. But in light of the gospel, Paul says, 
that even those, the sufferings of this present time, are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. In us. God's glory will not finally just be revealed to us at the end of all things, but in us as its power literally penetrates us and transforms our very beings. And we receive new glorified bodies in the resurrection. So Paul is going to explain now, his aim here is how God's promise for the future, that promise that these bodies will be redeemed from decay and corruption and suffering is to inform our present or informs our present experience. Verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. So Paul wants his people or God's people earnestly waiting for something because he says, look at creation. Creation is eagerly waiting. Creation is eagerly waiting. That's what the glory of God at the end of all things will finally do to us. It will cut through us to reveal who we really are, what God has actually done to us in and through Christ by His Spirit. Then we'll see what it actually is to be a child of God. And all creation is eagerly waiting for this to happen. The glory of God to be revealed in us. All that God made, from the dirt, to the trees, to the animals, to the oceans, to the mountains, they all know, it all knows that this day spoken of in verse 19 of the revealing of the sons of God is coming. And this creation, the entire cosmos, the eternal Son of God who is the Word of God spoke into existence has an earnest expectation for the final reveal of God's redemption in us. Now, why does the creation have that? Where did it get it from? Paul goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 here in verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God, that liberty that will be ours when God's glory is finally revealed in us. When humanity fell in Adam in Genesis 3, God cursed the serpent, He cursed the man, He cursed the woman, and He cursed the ground. And here, that curse is described as God subjecting all of creation, us included, in it, of course, to futility, meaninglessness, vanity. That's the lot of being a human being, and it's unavoidable. The creation didn't ask for that. The creation didn't want that. And even Adam, when you think about it, although he willfully transgressed God's command, he didn't willfully, joyfully embrace the idea of a curse. And humanity will struggle against the curse for its entire history. This futility is life now in a state because of sin where we're completely unable to fulfill the purpose for which God created us. Living outside of that is pure futility. We do all kinds of things. We do all kinds of things, right? We do innumerable things, wonderful things, many of them. But it's all in futility, in vanity. Because having been separated from God, none of it truly fulfills us. Right? So we work and we work and we work and we try and we try and we love and we gain and we lose and we get and we search for more and one way or another we find out eventually that everything is pointless it doesn't do what we want it to do nothing delivers right we can't escape time we can't escape death we were created to worship god and live in love and communion with him but our sin has separated us from Him and He subjected us to the gods we wanted to worship rather than Him. He gave us what we wanted. We begrudge Him for it, which is very ironic. He talks about this. Paul talked about this at length, you remember, in the first chapter of Romans. All the awfulness in the world is the result of being allowed to do what you want to do. It's not God's fault. It's our fault. And if we're going to 
blame him. That means we have to admit that he's responsible and worship him as Lord. We're stuck in our own futility. Life created to find identity in the worship of God alone is futile when God is not worshiped alone. So nothing works as it should. It's all broken. The whole creation was subjected to this futility. So creation also is eagerly waiting to be put back into the state it was in before everything began to decay. This is why grizzly bears eat people. This is why dogs get old and die. And they're dogs, right? Wonderful animals. And they die and they get sick and they leave or whatever. And you can't have them forever. This is why. This is why floods and tornadoes and mudslides and earthquakes kill and destroy. It's not because God is walking around with a ledger going, oh, you sinned today? That's a really bad thunderstorm that's going to damage your car. No, it's that the world is in a state of decay. Because we sinned long ago in Adam. All creation is groaning and aching and waiting. When, when, you, when we go out and look at nature and all its beauty and grandeur and glory, are we remembering that the Bible says what you're looking at that is so beautiful is groaning in expectation for something? We don't talk much about the expectation of creation, just what we see in it. But what we can't see is how it, even it longs, eagerly waits to be set free from the corruption imposed upon it because of us. It'd rather see us do something different for it. And it is God who will bring this about through his son, the true Adam, the true good steward of all creation, because he doesn't sin. Creation has an expectation because, so notice that, rather than the creation being bitter at the way of things in it, God, it has an expectation because God subjected it to futility in hope, not just to be mean and cruel, but in hope of something. Hope for what? What Paul describes in verses 19 and 20, the revealing of the sons of God. God told creation when he cursed it, that one day I am going to reverse all of this. And creation heard it right up against the curse in Genesis 3, remember, is the promise in Genesis 3. Creation heard it. Creation still believes it. Creation is not sinful for all that God created is good. We mess it up. We take plants that were made for our good and turn them into drugs that destroy us. We do that. It's eagerly expecting and waiting for this day to come, the day when God reveals the fullness of just what it was that Jesus did when he accomplished redemption. So there's no saving or preserving of the earth that will ever take place apart from God's final redemption of humanity. Until that happens, this world is not going to get better. And we aren't going to save it or fix it. Not spiritually, not physically, not ecologically. That doesn't mean we don't have to be good stewards of it. We ought to be, as Christians, the best stewards of the earth. But it's not going to have its corruption taken away until the final day when God reveals His redemption and His glory in us when His Son comes for us again. Yes, beloved, we have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit in us. He'll talk about that in verse 23. We have that right now. We have been given what he called in verse 15, the spirit of adoption, the Holy Spirit of God. But we're still included in the creation that is groaning until the end. God made a promise in Genesis 3 to the creation also, even as he was subjecting it to futility. So in verse 21, it also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Just like us, you know. You see how Paul is, um, further characterizes this futility in verse 21. Futility is the bondage of corruption that we in all creation experience because of the curse. It's the effect of the fall. To be released from that 
is what it truly means to be free, to be liberated as a human being. This freedom is associated in the text with, in, in the, text with the glory of the children of God. Earlier in Romans 8, liberation, freedom, was the work of God on an individual. Here, that freedom is also going to be experienced by the creation, by the ground, by all that God has made. The freedom of all creation is the result of God fulfilling that promise from Genesis 3.15 in the death and resurrection of Christ. It's a whole new creation that's promised. Where Jesus is the head and not Adam. It's precisely what is promised in the new heaven and the new earth in Revelation 21. God gave this hope to creation with His Word. With His Word. With a promise. And beloved, there is a sense in which we are being reminded in every tornado, every blizzard, every animal attack, that creation is waiting in hope for the promise to finally be revealed. The creation is also saying, get us out of here. Take this away. Today we in all creation are imprisoned to corruption. It's everywhere and in everything. This present time and its sufferings that Paul spoke of in verse 18, that began all the way back in Genesis 3 and will continue until the final day when God's glory is fully revealed in us. Humanity at the curse of creation will also be present at the redemption of creation. When instead of being cursed, God glorifies those who are in His Son. Verse 22, for we know, we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. We know this, Paul says, because we're a part of this. Really, Paul? Everything is in a state of groaning and laboring, even Christians. Yes, beloved. Yes. Becoming a Christian doesn't change the creation. It doesn't make it work for us now. It doesn't undo the curse. Not globally, not corporately. We are still subject to its futility and its corruption. What kind of life then? is reasonable to expect for the children of God in a groaning and aching world of which they themselves are a part. Why? And I know in part because some of the reasons we suffer are so heavy. But why is it that suffering and trials and the fact that nothing works, why does this mess with our faith so much? God literally told us that's how it would be. What do we think He said to us versus what did He actually say to us is where we need to think and how we need to think. Paul's opponents would have been shocked or even angry to hear this because their particular brand of Christianity, just like the crossless, corruptionless Christianity, so many books and teachers and preachers, preachers promise can be yours today and now if you just give this or do that. Right? They teach you, you shouldn't be so pessimistic about things. We should speak of ourselves, of Christians as, we shouldn't be speaking of ourselves as Christians with such defeatist language. As being subjected to suffering and futility and bondage to corruption like the rest of creation under the curse. We aren't like that, Paul. Yes, you are. And so am I. If you're a human being, saved or not, yes, you are. That's reality. Doesn't mean God doesn't love you when you suffer. It doesn't mean that like you're worthless when you're going through difficulty after difficulty after difficulty. Like God, God seems very silent when other Christians in our lives, and I'm not putting them down, I'm talking about just categorically speaking, when other people or other Christians in our lives, everything is going so well. And for us, it's like it gets worse every day. Beloved, this is not an occasion to say, God, where are you? Beloved, He's right here. It's the ebb and flow of life in a fallen world. And yes, we can make decisions. It can be our fault entirely that our lives are difficult and hard. Absolutely, that's the case often. There's also, and, but even then, it's not, 
Does he not love you because you've made a mess? While you were a sinner, he died for you. He knows the you that's a mess. He died for the you that's a mess. So don't, don't run from him. He's not turning his back. Believer, he will never turn his back on you. Ever. He's the good shepherd. The good shepherd. But don't, don't do this to yourself. Don't do this to yourself. Don't compare yourselves to other Christians when the, the means of that comparison are not biblical. Right? God just must want to make life harder for me. He just doesn't. Beloved, we go in and out. We ebb and flow. And yes, for some of us, it seems like we ebb a lot more than we flow or flow a lot more than we ebb. More often than not, it's not evidence of the quality of you as an individual. It's the evidence of the fact that this world is broken and futile and corrupt and in bondage. And you could do your best and you're still going to die. You're still going to get sick. You're still going to face difficulties. Thanks, preacher. Well, I mean... Why... The, the, that's reality. This, this futility and corruption will affect our careers and our investments and our health and our children and our governments and our churches. And on and on it goes. Why are we so shocked that the world is hard to live in? That people are impossible. That's like things are just dead set against us. Why? And nothing works, and everything dies, and everything rots, and nothing is ever really as promised. In the middle of that reality, why would we not want to hear that this is a temporary state that nobody can avoid, rather than God just deciding to make your Monday extremely miserable, or your life? Why would we not like to hear that while in these mortal bodies Paul keeps talking about here in Romans, it will rarely feel like we are justified, adopted children of God. What are we groaning for God to do? Keep His Word or change the world so that we can be happy in it? You want this world to end, trust me. We want our nations and our kingdoms to last forever, never go away, never die, never decay. Why? Beloved, why are we so afraid to die of this world ending? Why are we so afraid of the apocalypse? It is our liberation. Let it come. How long do you want to live in the bondage of corruption? How long do you want to groan without seeing? And no, you don't want to leave your loved ones behind. And I'm not trying to make light of that or something. And it's not a sin when there are things in your life and in creation that you love. That, that Those aren't sins. What I'm saying is at the, the macro level of life. Why do we mortgage everything to avoid death? Why do we mortgage everything to avoid suffering? Are we trying to make the world into something that God will not let it be? And so no wonder there's this distance imposed by us between us and God because it doesn't really seem like He loves us. Because if He did, He would fix this. Beloved, fixing it means ending it. We have to come to terms with the fact that staying and being in this world means suffering and futility. And leaving or being here when God redeems all of it at the return of His Son is the only thing that gives glory to our lives. God revealing us, us, stuck right now in these mortal bodies, still struggling with sin, one day to be His very own children. That person was mine, God will say one day. Justified, adopted, and fully glorified on a promised day in the future. That is the birth, the new life coming 
for which creation is groaning in labor pains. It saw you cursed and it devastated it. And now it wants to see you redeemed. This is the promise of a new heaven and a new earth where we will be revealed in glory as God's children. That phrase you read there, until now, in verse 22, until now is letting every generation of Christians make this text their own. It was until now when now was like A.D. 49. Until now is now in 2023. Letting every generation of Christians know from the moment it was first written, until now, whenever and wherever now is, that the world under the curse will basically always look and feel the same for us. It's not just the unbelievers in nature and all the rest of creation that are groaning in the bondage of corruption. Verse 23, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, that is, who do know that we're sealed for this coming day of redemption, he spoke of in verse 18 and 19, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body just like creation is eagerly waiting the redemption of what it groans in. Remember in verse 15, Paul told us that we receive the spirit of adoption. Amen. The Holy Spirit of God by whom we cry out like God's true children do, Abba, Father. Beloved, the fullness of what it means to be adopted by God, though, the fullness of that, that hasn't happened yet. Don't mean something is insufficient in what Christ did. We're looking at what the text is telling us. You've received the spirit of adoption. You haven't come into your own as fully grown sons yet. We haven't moved into the new house, so to speak. But the forms have been signed. And the debt has been paid. The tangible reality of what it means to be adopted by God, the scripture says, is the actual redemption of this literal body. And that, according to verses 18 through 25, takes place only in the future. Yes, we're a new creation in Christ right now. Yes and amen. But we also still have a connection to the old creation as long as we live in this world. What is it? We love it. This mortal body. Mortal, broken, decaying, corrupted, suffering body. Bodies have the first fruits of the Spirit. That is, as much as the Spirit that has been poured out already. We have all of it in this body. We've received the Spirit of, a, of, of sonship, of adoption in this body but we still await the appointed time that we, again, come of age, so to speak, as sons. That sonship, which is our present standing with God, is hidden right now with God, just like our lives are right now in Colossians 3.3. Our lives are hidden with Christ in God. Until then, until the revealing of this truth in us, in us, we wait and we hope and we groan for freedom and for glory because we don't yet possess those things in tangible form or in their fullness. But it's guaranteed. It's written in stone and in blood. It's written in the stars that at a time set by the Father, the Christian will enter into the rights and privileges, if you will, of being a son of God, a child of God. The time when the sinfulness in us is fully and finally purged from our bodies is the redemption of our bodies that completes God's work of redemption in us when we take full eternal ownership of all that He claimed for us in His purchase of us in Christ, but not yet. So in this in-between, between two worlds, don't begrudge God for life in this body, forgetting that your real life is hidden with Christ in God until that day, and He will bring it to you. To you, personally, every single one of you who believes or will believe. Verse 24, for we are saved in this hope. 
I thought I had it all. You do, but you're saved in hope of something more. We were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one hope for what he sees? Meditate, beloved, on Romans 8, 24. Every chance you get, why does one hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Don't doubt the promise in the midst of futility and the bondage of corruption and the groaning and the birth pains. That is going to be our experience. This theology in verse 24 is the foundation of all that Paul has said here. We were saved in this hope. Hope about the future. While we live in the creation, we are saved now in the hope of being saved then. We wait in hope for the redemption also of our bodies because only then will we see the promise in its fullness with perfection and holiness being obvious and complete, living physical lives in a literal new heaven and a new earth, a literal new creation. We wait for this. We don't have it yet. That's why we live in hope. That's why we were saved in hope. Hoping and seeing are mutually exclusive things, aren't they? Where there's one, there isn't the other. Beloved, children of God, we are a people of perseverance until we get somewhere. We are not a people of accomplishment because we've arrived somewhere. We need to persevere, beloved in the midst of groaning and futility and corruption and bondage and decay. The endurance that is held up by faith is needed if we're to come into final possession of what was promised to us in the promise. Beloved, we were subjected by God to this futility in hope in verse 20, and we were saved by God in that very same hope in verse 24. Hope is the essence of the life of a Christian as long as we live in mortal bodies. It's a life of hope. This is the whole reason why Christians live in this whole suffering now, glory later pattern. It's because he's not yet appeared to reveal the glory that is in us. But he will. He most certainly will. In verse 23, we eagerly groan and wait in hope for the redemption of these mortal bodies that are subject to futility and the bondage of corruption, that aren't disease proof, that aren't accident proof, that aren't poverty proof, that aren't depression proof, that can't stop sinning, that just can't shake off all this corruption, just like the rest of all creation. Don't set your expectations for life in this world too high. It doesn't mean you have to be a pessimist and every moment is miserable. No, that we're not Eeyore. All right? You know Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh? The little donkey just sucks the life out of every tree in the whatever acre wood. I don't know. In verse 24, we were saved in this hope. Saved in it. Meaning that we were not saved in the sense that here and now in this world and in these bodies, we tangibly possess or see our full redemption. We were not saved so that we would live without hope. Does that make sense? We were not saved so that we wouldn't have to hope for something more. We possess right now the hope that we will one day be delivered from all these things, from these bodies, which again, he's just building on the promise of 7 verse 24 that we will be delivered from this body of death. And he's adding on to it. He's saying, you won't just be delivered from this body of death, but from all this corruption and futility in which you live. One day that is going to happen because of what has happened in the past in Christ. 
which was the fulfillment of a promise that happened thousands of years before that and comes to fruition. What if it was today? What if it was today? You heard the trumpet, the sky split, and here he comes, and it's done. So in verses 24 and 25, we learn that we have nothing to see or experience now in this world that would make us think we've been delivered from all of it now. Such as to make hope unnecessary. You will get nowhere, have nothing, accomplish anything that will make hope for something better unnecessary. Ever. Ever. We need perseverance because we're people of hope in verse 25. What we have now, what we do have now, is the hope that God will keep the promise, which is the one hope a human can have that won't actually disappoint us in Romans 5, verse 5. Don't think of hope as you think, like I hoped one day I'd be able to own a Lamborghini or something, and you know that's never going to happen. This isn't that kind of hope. We've been saved from living without the promise that one day we'll be set free. That we do have. We don't see that freedom now. Therefore, we hope. We were saved to hope for that. Not that it's precarious and maybe it won't happen, but we hope it does. We live with this hope that's energized by a guarantee. It's God that is telling you to hope that you will get what he said. And the Bible is just a long book about how when God makes a promise, he keeps it. We hope for what we do not see. We don't hope in what we can see. So the believer's hope can never be in what we see in ourselves or in creation, but only in the promise, which is for the future, the down payment and guarantee given now when we were baptized in Romans 6 into the death of Christ. Right? For who hopes for what he sees? A Christian isn't hoping for what a Christian sees. A Christian hopes because a Christian can't see through all the muck and the corruption and the bondage. And here is God in His grace by the Spirit and His Son saying, I know you can't see, but I can. I know right where you are and everything you're going through. Stay on the path. Come to me. It's all done. It's all finished. It's all guaranteed. You're just still alive in this mortal body. If we could see all of this now, there'd be no need for hoping to receive all of it in the future. The verse would make no sense if we had total victory over sin right now. Total wealth, total health, total prosperity, total success, total glory. And absence makes the heart grow fonder, doesn't it? Beloved, God knows what He's doing. The more we wait in hope, the more our love for Him that brings about our obedience to Him, it will grow. It will grow. We must never move beyond the need for hope, which has its basis in nothing but grace. We are a people of perseverance. We are not a people of arrival. We shouldn't act like we are. Some some teaching wants us to have or promises us that we can have all of it now. The purpose of that is to do away with or get around the need for hope. But the Bible says we need perseverance. Why? Because we actually are people of hope. We, try to, we want to find a brand of Christianity or reading the Bible or whatever that lets us trade in this hope for certainty and all of it now. And we don't realize we're that older son or we're that younger son that didn't know his father loved him. That thought the best was out there, outside the sphere of his dad's love and provision. So give me my inheritance now.
I have it now, but I can't have it now. Right? The only certainty we're given is that the promise will be fulfilled, that we will be delivered from the futility and bondage of corruption we're trapped in in this creation to these mortal bodies on a day set in the future that God only knows. So we walk by faith and not by sight. So don't get out ahead of your skis this morning, beloved. We'll not arrive as long as we're in these bodies. But we will not always be in these bodies. For he who began this good work in us will complete it. So let hope increase and all the rest that God has commanded will follow.